AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey Edwards and Tony Schiavone here with another, another amazing guest. Uh, just want to point out that uh, we did an interview with Mikey Ruckus. Not sure if it's airing before or after this one. But uh, this guest has significantly more guitars in his frame. Uh, I don't know if that <laughs> provides credibility as a musician or not, but I'm going to say it does. Uh, first off, how are you doing today, Tony? Aubrey, I am great. It's great to be talking to you as always. We are such good friends. And not only that, we are co-workers and it's great seeing you. The good news is that you and I, uh, you know, work on the Dynamite Weeks and then on the off weeks, a lot of times we do podcasting. So we get to see each other on a weekly basis, which is cool. Yeah, I'm doing great. It's great. But thanks for asking. It's great to be with you. And it's great to be with, with our guests at this time. Truly, truly one of my favorites to be able to call a match of his and be able to work with him because he is such a pro. Frankie Kazarian. How you doing, buddy? Oh, that's me. Yeah, yeah that's, oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> I I am doing well. I have a, a child doing distance learning in the next room. I have two cats clawing at the door to get in. I have a uh, I have a hydraulic jackhammer in my backyard, and I have coffee dangerously close to my laptop. So what could go wrong? Nothing. Happy to be here with you guys. Oh, Sounds man. like a great day. Sounds like a great day. Okay, you are the self-described full-time metalhead, part-time Jedi, occasional Avenger. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes. Okay, I get that. Uh, how good is your Jedi mind trick skills? Uh, well, after being in professional wrestling for uh, 23 years, uh, I've learned the art of BSing, which essentially is what the Jedi mind trick is, talking people <laughs> into things that they don't want to do. So I would say at this point, it's pretty uh, it's pretty spot on, pretty good. Always a work in progress, though. <laughs> Very. Cool. I mean, I think that means like everyone who's successful in wrestling ends up being a Jedi of some kind, right? There, there's, there's a very close correlation there, yes. Mm. Oh, man. Uh, wow, I just gazed over at Frankie's list of accomplishments, and this is just the highlights, because there's way too many fucking to list. I'm going to try and go through this in one breath. I'm mm. going to fail. Okay. Inaugural AEW World Tag Team Champion with Scorpio Sky, two-time pro wrestling Gorilla World Championship, five-time TNA X Division Champion, three-time TNA World Tag Team Champion, two times with CD. 2017 a fight for the right tournament champ 2008 and 2019 a king of the mountain championship <gasps> three-time ring of honor world tag team champion two with cd one with scorpio sky one time ring of honor six-man tag team champion with cd and scorpio sky 2005 future legends award from cauliflower alley club 2012 wrestling observer newsletter team of the year with cd and 2006 wrestling observer newsletter worked worst worked match of the year for the tna reverse battle royal at Oof. tna impact Wow, what a great one to end on. <laughs> yeah. Woof, woof, woof. <laughs> oh, yes. They uh, failed to mention my uh, 1988 Boys and Girls Club of the High Desert uh, bubblegum blowing uh, contest, which I placed first in. So um, wow. how dare you, Wikipedia? What the, you, the other I, one that's unmentioned a lot is your two out of three falls beer drinking comp uh, competition with Adam Page from The Boat which is one of the highlights and honors of my career to officiate. <laughs> we can get into that because you were, you had the best seat in the house and you saw, <laughs> you saw everything go from fun to real in the blink of an eye. Real bad, Ooh, real boy. bad. <laughs> Frankie, you just had a match on television against Christian Cage. You called him uh, top three best wrestlers you've ever been in the ring with. Why such high praise? And uh, tell us what do you, why you think makes Christian, and first of all, what a match. Wow. What what a way to start the program, by the way. Uh, what makes Christian so good, and why do you think you guys mesh so well? Uh, first and foremost, thank you. Always a pleasure hearing that from you. And, you know, to this day, having you and JR call my matches is still, to a, you know, a small boy who grew up watching this, still surreal. So if I don't tell you enough, thank you very much for, thank you for, saying for that. Yeah. writing the lyrics to the music I give you guys. Uh, uh -huh. Christian is, and uh, I learned this the first time I – wrestled him in 2007 uh, a guy that has maybe the highest wrestling IQ that I've ever been in the ring with. And when I say that, I mean, just having mastered professional wrestling, knowing what works, what doesn't uh, whether it be on the fly or just ideas he has in the back uh, just ring positioning, body placement, uh, just little nuances, the things that go in between the moves that most people don't ever really get to see 
the guy just has an outstanding mind for professional wrestling. I cannot sing his praise high enough. And I am, I am so genuinely happy that he's here with us in AEW and gets to experience this company. Cause as you guys know, Tony, you, especially AEW is so very different behind the scenes uh, than any other wrestling company is or, is or ever has been. So it's amazing. One of, one of the things that, I mean, we, we've said it time and time again, uh, it had been seven years since Christian Cage had last wrestled. And I think one of the things that you had said coming back through the curtain as we're all standing there, like just shocked about how great this match was, is I think you had said he never missed a step. Like it just felt like he had been wrestling this whole time. Yeah. Not only did it, not only did he not lose a step, he might be better than ever. Whoa. Which is which is unreal, you know? Uh unreal. Um he uh just it, it was amazing. I, I don't know that I could do that. Seven years, seven years <laughs> being away, I don't know that I could do that. Uh like guys, seven year professional wrestling is such a very, very difficult thing to, to, first of all, to even have the courage to do. We put ourselves out there like nobody else does. And it's so, it's, it's a difficult way to make a living. Uh, you know, this, the industry is tough. And, you know, I've, I've been, you know, I've been injured. I've been sit on the shelf. The longest I've been out was, was seven months. And I was with the torn tricep and coming back from seven months was, nerve wracking and physically taxing and mentally challenging. This guy's been out of the ring for seven years and to come back in that shape, to have that timing and just to that, that much focus. It's, I, I don't, I don't know that I could do that. Uh, he's a special athlete and I hope people realize now just how amazing and special Christian Cage is, uh, you know, he's, he's often been called one of the most underrated wrestlers there's been. And people have put that tag on me. And I, and I, I always, I wear that as a badge of honor. If you're going to call me underrated, that's fine because you've called a lot of my heroes underrated guys like Christian Cage, guys like Jerry Lynn, guys like Dean Malenko, and Kurt Hennig, Rick Rude. Those are guys that are my heroes, Tito Santana. So I'll wear that. I'll wear that with a badge of honor. Um, and again, like I said, I can't sing his praise high enough. Uh, it's just it, it's really amazing, and I hope people see the the gravity of how special this is for him, for me, for AEW. Yeah, listen, we're going to sing your praises too because you talked about underrated, and there is no question. And and I'll say this to the day I die, and Frankie, you realize this, all of us realize this. To make a great match takes two people, mm-hmm. and uh, so that was a tremendous match, not only because of what Christian Cage can do. But it's because of what you can do in the ring and the stories you can tell and how you can how you conduct your business. So uh, take that to heart. Uh, it, it was legit a great match. It's because legit we had two great performers in the ring. And and so uh, kudos for that. I want to ask you about uh, signing with AEW. Um, when, when did you consider this or when did this all happen for you? I was kind of in on the ground floor of all this, uh, right. being very, very good friends with Matt and Nick, um, Cody, and, you know, getting to hear the rumblings early on, you know, really before the world knew about it. Only a handful of people knew about what, you know, this the vision, the idea of what AEW was going to be. And, uh, and hearing about this and knowing what the idea was and knowing what we wanted to do not just for ourselves, but for the entire professional wrestling industry. I was on board before day one is pretty much all I can say. I was, I was, I was sold the minute I heard about the concept. Uh, of course, when the first time I met Tony, uh, was blown away just at his wrestling knowledge and just the courage he had and his, and his vision and his foresight for what he wanted to do with AEW and, and, and just his, like I said, his courage just to take that first step. So uh, I, I was in on the ground floor, which is why SEU was part of the 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 announcement of AEW that we, you know, were one of the first nine guys to sign. So we were here from day one, and uh, it was kind of a no-brainer for us. 
you had mentioned first time meeting TK and just being appreciative of his uh, courage and whatnot in doing this. Is there any sort of wrestling stat that he threw at you where you're like, oh, God, how, how the hell does he know everything about me? Because he sort of does that for everyone. Sure. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, he always, he always just throws out like, uh, like, you know, like, Oh yeah. When you, when you worked Kurt and he'll give me the exact date, you you worked Kurt Angle for the title TNA. And I was like, yeah, I remember the, I remember the match. I don't remember. And I'm pretty good with that. Cause I I've written down everything since day one. So I'm pretty good with that, but he knows it like to the T just off the top of his head, but yeah, he can, he can, you know, spout off angles that happened in mid South with Jerry Lawler in 1983 and just get, it's, it's, it's really cool because you know, I, it's like, you know, yes, he's my boss. Yes, he's a powerful man, but he's a wrestling fan. So it's really cool to, to sit with him at the end of the night and uh, maybe have a beverage and just talk about wrestling like I would with my uh, with my other pals. It's just cool. Uh, you were on uh, Being the Elite and you mentioned that uh, Being the Elite made SCU and you also uh, want to we want you to talk about uh, the worst town ever. Oh, so good. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, yeah. So, so the bit was literally just Matt Jackson had the idea one day and he said, we know we need to just film you guys because every time we would, we would pull into a town that was particularly dumpy or, you know, somewhere <laughs> Which is a that lot was, of towns in wrestling. right. <laughs> or somewhere that was cold, you know, we're all, we're all guys from Southern California. So we're climatized. So everywhere's cold to us. You know, we would be like, oh, this town sucks. God, why is it so cold? Look at this building. This is when we were on the road to the Ring of Honor. And and Matt would just go like, you know, I'm just going to film you guys one day. We're just going to get out of a car and we're just just and just cut your promo like you do. Because it was kind of it wasn't far off from what we would really do. So we started doing that and we just did it in every town we were in and it caught on. And at the time we were heels. But after, you know, a month or two on BTE, the fans just thought it was so funny. So we came out and the fans just started being giving us very positive reception. So instead of, you know, this is the worst town I've ever been in, boo, which is wrestling 101, you know, when you want to get that easy heel reaction, you know, this town sucks, boo. It turned into Scorp would hit that line and the place would say it with them. And it just started growing and growing and growing. And it was just like, this is weird. Like we go out there, we bury the town and the place likes us even more, which I don't know how, I don't know if that had ever been done in pro wrestling. No, it's very it unique. Hasn't. You know, it was when you have the whole, you, got, you know, you guys remember when we were doing uh, arenas, I know that said, that sounds like years ago, but mm. we would go and sometimes we do like, you know, either we'd go, we do like a dark off camera stuff. When we go out there, we would do our bit and the, you know, eight, 10, 12,000 people saying this is the worst town I've ever been in and popping. And right. uh, so it, it was it was a weird phenomenon. And it certainly took uh, SCU to a different plateau than we were on at, at that point. I, I always found it weird because, you, like you said, you would come out and you would just rag on the town and they go, yeah. Pro wrestling in the, in, the, in the new millennium, man. It's just <laughs> you never you never know what's going to work. I just thought it because it was so entertaining because Sky's delivery, you know, he, he hit the line perfectly every time mm-hmm. I would do my rant which, you know, I became known for just bare. And then CD would throw in his one liner, like only CD can. And we just had our stick and it just worked. Uh, the AEW championship match on the tournament against uh, the Lucha brothers. Oh. Talk about, talk about that match, putting that match together. Cause that was really something that was really a way to kick off. I think a tag team division. Thank you very much. Uh, our, our tag team division was, it is loaded beyond belief. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lucha brothers are such a phenomenal tag team and just their style is spectacular. Ray Phoenix is going to go down as one of the absolute best high flyers in the history of pro wrestling. No question. And, Absolutely. And Pinta just with, with that, that innovation and that look, and those guys are so unique and unorthodox sky and I are, you know, yes, we can do some flying and stuff, but our, our bread and butter is our wrestling. You know, so there could have been a styles clash there, but the way that the match came together and just how professional those guys are uh, and the fact that that the the bigness of that match, the fact that it was the first ever AEW tag team championship match was was huge. And that's not lost on me, lost on me. I've, I've been in this business a long time and there's not a lot of firsts to do, but to be the first ever AEW champion is something I'm so very proud of. I'm very proud of that match. I'm, I'm 
I'm so happy of the body of work that Sky and I did, uh, our time as a team. And uh, that was just such, such a cool way to kick off kind of my, my career in AEW and, and set the standard for what I want to do going forward. How surprised were you when you found out that you were going to be the first tag team champions, knowing that all of the other tag teams that we had signed at AEW at that point? Uh, yeah, surprised is one way to put it. Um, honored, uh, you know, championships in pro wrestling. Uh, people can call them what they will. Some people call them a prop. Uh, I will never call them that because for a promoter or owner of a company to have uh, – to put a title on a person, be it tag team or singles, that promoter, he or she has to have the utmost faith in that person or those two people that, that he is confident that he, that these people are going to represent his company. So that's not lost on me being a traditionalist that has never lost on me. So very, very honored uh, because I knew, I knew what AEW was going to become. And I knew we were just going to continue to grow as we are to this very day. So I, I knew that being the first was going to be very special. And I was just thrilled, elated and honored, especially when you look around at our tag team division at the time. And it was, I mean, you have SE, but you have, you have the young bucks, you have private party, you have the Lucha brothers, you have Jurassic express, you have TH2 uh, on and on and on and on. So just uh, again, another huge badge of honor. Like this is, this is so cool. This is, you know, this is, you know, the culmination of years of hard work, but just, just you know, a, a look into the future of what the business is going to be. It's just real cool. We're talking with Frankie Gazarian, a man of many talents, and we'll talk more about his talents in a moment. <music> AEW Unrestricted, talking to one of our favorites, one of the real pros, one of the great wrestlers that we have. And we have many, but this is one of the best. Frankie Gazarian is with us. Uh, and, uh, by the way, I am uh, in the worst town in the world, by the way. Uh, is that right? Yes. No, well, we have I'm, a, yes, we have, right. everybody asks us all the time, not to cut you off, Tony. Everybody asks us when we, when meet and greets were a thing, what is the actual worst town we've ever been in? Mm -hmm. And our go-to answer was it's a, uh, it's a tie. There's SoCal best town. Every other place on earth is tied for the worst town. <laughs> <laughs> No, I uh, people say, "Hey, you live in Atlanta, don't you?" I go, "Nope, I live in Marietta, and I there love Marietta." So there you go. There you so go. I want I want to qualify it. Uh, right. I like the suburbs, and I like the life away from the downtown areas. Although downtown LA is pretty cool at places. It can be, yeah. I'm yep. also out. I'm out in the desert. I'm out by Joshua Tree, so I'm two hours out of LA. So I kind of got my sure. own little slice of desert heaven out here. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, we've talked a, a little bit about your match against the Lucha brothers for the championship. You dropped the titles uh, to uh, Kenny Omega, Hangman Adam Page on the Jericho Cruise, uh, a match that Sky said he got motion sickness in. Uh, do, what do you remember about that match? Yeah. I, um, yeah. So the, you know, just the situation being on a boat was very unique, very cool. Uh, but what people may not know is that, that ring had to be specifically made for that boat because it's on a boat. So it has to be, there has to be a structure built underneath to hold the ring in place. And so the ring was a little bit or a lot harder of a bump. It, mm. At least it felt like that to me. Okay. So uh, it just, the ring itself felt very, very just hard and solid. And the match, you know, those two guys, uh, Kenny Omega, you know, what can I say? As I've been said, and Hangman Adam Page, one of my favorite opponents, one of the absolute best in the company and a hard hitting son of a bitch. So that match was very, very physical. And we, we took a lot of risks and all, I, I don't remember a whole lot of seasickness, but I just remember feeling like I had been hit by a truck afterwards. Just, just my back was killing me. The one time I needed the docks and uh, they weren't like, they weren't right there after the match. And I was like, where are they? Uh, yeah. It was just, just a physically taxing match. And, uh, you know, being on a cruise and, you know, the Jericho cruise, I didn't get a whole lot of sleep, you know, because I was uh, up all night. None uh, of us did. None of us You know, I was up all night. Yeah. Uh, meeting fans and and meeting having fans. and uh, yeah, you know, so it was just yeah, it was it was draining. And just yeah, I, I didn't really I didn't get the motion sickness until I, I want to say the next day. But uh, the, the match itself was just was just brutal. And uh, 
it was a long one and uh just and just just the environment just being on a boat was just different and it took some getting used to but it was cool i think the ring was smaller too that might have been why it hurt so much it might have been yeah i think the ring might have been like just because of the specific specific specifications easy for me to say right mm. uh, it might have been a little bit smaller and it was just uh yeah just the setup was kind of wacky but hey what can you do you set up a ring i'm gonna wrestle there so outside of wrestling, you play bass in a couple metal bands, Gutter Candy, uh, Vex Temper. Yes. Uh, are you looking forward to playing live again? I really am. I really, really am. Uh, you know, my, my band, uh, Vex Temper is kind of a band I just record with now. Gutter Candy is the band I would I would play gigs with. And, you know, we are playing, you know, anywhere from two to six times a month, just local bars, small clubs. Uh, and it just, it's just, it, something I really enjoy. Just another outlet for me creatively. I love the guys I play with. You know, we played like 80s and 90s, uh, like rock radio stuff and a lot of originals. And, uh, you know, when that was taken away from us, our last gig, we played a gig at the Whiskey in LA, which was really cool. And that was one of our last gigs. And all of a sudden it was taken away from us. And it was just, I really miss it. And I hope that when, you know, we get back to normal, we're getting there slowly, but surely thank God that people appreciate live music in, in every form, whether it be a, a band playing at your local watering hole, or if it's, uh, you know, giant concerts and stadiums, I hope people appreciate live music uh, when, when we're back to being able to enjoy that type of thing. Who or, or what got you interested in playing bass or, or playing live music? So I've always been a fan of music. Uh, grew up a huge rock and roll and heavy metal fan. And uh, I wanted to, uh, growing up, I wanted to play bass guitar and be a pro wrestler. And uh, so when I was, uh, right when I graduated high school, my grandfather who lived in Las Vegas was a musician and had learned that I wanted to play bass guitar. And he actually gave me my first bass guitar, which was a, a 1966 Fender Mustang bass guitar, which is a very valuable Mm. instrument and i learned on that and i was self-taught i just learned how to you know learn by ear and learn to read tablature and started progressing a little bit and like everybody else does got together with buddies in the garage and started jamming and started to get decent at the instrument but right around that time professional wrestling took over and when i started professional wrestling training i was when i say obsessed i mean obsessed i was consumed with the business uh, so the instrument kind of, you know, got put on the back burner years later, I picked it up and started to slowly, but surely get into it again. And, you know, just would basically just, you know, play along to songs, write stuff. And then, uh, probably about 10 years ago, when I moved back to Southern California, got back in touch with some guys and started jamming and, you know, one thing led to another and, you know, formed bands and put out original material and started gigging. And it just, it's. So it's now been, you know, 25 years since I started playing. Oh. Goes by quickly, doesn't over, it? We're going to put over all of your uh, outside ventures, but you've also got the American Rebel Cigars. Yes, American Rebel Cigars. Um, this logo right here, and uh, that's one of the logos. Uh, another, another passion of mine is I enjoy a good cigar, a fine cigar, if you will. Uh, when I first met Cody, um, several years ago uh found out that he also enjoys cigars and we would you know have a cigar we were talking and you know literally one of us just said like why don't we have our own cigar because at the time cody had his own wine out and i was like why don't we have our own cigar we kind of would joke back and forth and then one day we just kind of put it out there and we're like well let's see let's see if we can get any interest in this so we kind of put it out there on a tweet just to get some traction and we had some people within the industry contact us and one thing led to another, and here we are. Uh, we're looking at almost three years later. We got American Rebel Cigars. They, uh, in the cigar community, everybody that has had them very much enjoys them. They're a very smooth uh, smoke. Um, a lot of wrestling fans have gotten turned on to them uh, because of us, and it's cool. It's just another one of those passion projects, something we enjoy doing. We would do uh, live events called Smoke and Mirrors, and we would uh, basically – it basically be like a meet and greet with us have, hanging out, smoking cigars, and those are really cool. I'm looking forward to doing those again eventually. You know, there's uh, a lot of times, uh, at least back when we were at the uh, Hyatt, uh, there would be some uh, some of guys smoking cigars out on the out on the deck there. And uh, 
I, I learned because I'm not into it, but I learned that smoking a cigar is like an art, right? Mm -hmm. It really is. There's a lot to yeah. it. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities to people that are fine wine connoisseurs. You just right. you learn you learn right. the notes and you learn, you know, like you learn how to light it, what fluid to light it with. Uh, right. Sometimes you light it with a cedar plank and, you know, you get different notes. The cigar tastes different at the very beginning, the middle and the end. And mm -hmm. there's a, there really is there's a lot of sophistication to it. And, uh, sure. you know, I, uh, I and I've, I've learned this as as I've gone. You know, it's it's taken me several years and, you know, uh, being a you know, cigar devotee. But, yeah, it really is. It's 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 therapeutic because a good cigar will take you anywhere from a half an hour to an hour and change to, to smoke it. So I sit out on my deck and that's kind of when I'm most at peace, you know, looking off into the desert, just thinking of everything and nothing at once. And that's, that's really therapy for me. And it's, and I've also bonded with a lot of people, given my cigars to people, made a lot of friends. And uh, it's just, a, a, there's, it's a real cool community. My favorite cigar is always the one shared with friends. I'm not at the point yet where I know all the different notes and stuff, but no, but you have, you have everyone. been out there and yes. I have handed you a cigar and yes. you have, uh, you have partaked and, uh, enjoyed. So you've, you've been right there with us. I'm very much a fan. Love it. Awesome. So you've, you've got your first action figure coming out available for pre-order. How exciting does that feel? <laughs> really cool. I, uh, uh, you know, more, more so nowadays it's cool for my son to have an actual action figure of me to beat up instead of the real me to beat up. Uh, I, I, I had a, uh, I had an action figure come out in TNA and uh, that was cool at the time. But the weird thing was the, the image they used for my action figure was a look that I had for maybe a month. And I had like, my gear sucked. I, my hair was weird. And it was just like the worst point of your career, like to, to like freeze frame and put into an action figure form. I was just like, ugh. like it, part of me when I saw it, it was like, oh, cool. My action figure. But I was like, oh, like my hair. I looked like Biff Tannen from 1985 from Back to the Future. Just my gear sucked. It was bad. But looking at the prototypes of this one and the images I've seen, it's so spot on and so cool. And just the detail is, is rad and it's uh, the gear that Scorp and I won the tag titles in. And it's, it's just so cool. It's, it's just another one of those, you know, I, I kind of consider this my first real action figure uh, just because the likeness is, is so cool. I'm so pleased with it. Uh, and it, it's, it's so cool. It's another thing, you know, being uh, somebody who's, you know, 20 plus years in the business now with a family of my own, it's not lost on me. Just these little things that, that maybe, you know, a decade ago would have been. You also were on the Glow series, uh, you and uh, CD as independent wrestlers. How was that to shoot? Very cool. It's funny you mentioned that. I was digging through some old stuff yesterday, and I found my script, the Glow script, and uh, it's you know a bound script, and it says I still have the post it on. It says muscular wrestler number two, Frankie Kazarian. Uh, he was number one. CD, <laughs> of CD. course. What? No CD, way. CD, no way. CD always gets top billing over me. Always. Yeah. Always. Oh man. <laughs> And I'll, I'll let it slide because he's got seniority in the business and in age, but ah, he's yeah. always got top billing over me. Someday I'm going to flip flop that. Uh, but that was cool. That was an opportunity that came up and we jumped on it. We uh, both have the benefit of living in SoCal and both of us are SAG AFTRA uh, card carrying members. Right. So, uh, and we are obviously professional wrestlers. So they brought us down and it was really cool. An old friend of ours, Chavo Guerrero, is the wrestling coordinator on that show. And uh, so we got in there. We did our thing. It was it was really fun. Uh, it's, you know, as as goes anything in Hollywood, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. Right. Do your stuff. But it, but it was really cool. They kind of just let, let us put our own sequence together. Our, our scene was brief, but it was it was a cool experience. I've done a handful of like commercial and television and movie stuff. And this was this was one of the most positive experiences. And. Uh, the show was so well received and so well done yeah. that uh, all the wrestling fans were psyched to see familiar faces on it. I remember when I was watching, going, "I, I think I know those guys. Yeah. I think I've, I think I've watched them on other stuff. I, I don't know." And you did the whole Wikipedia search. You're like, "Oh, yeah. Oh shit, yeah. I know, I know those guys. It's awesome. They brought in actual like." really awesome professional wrestler just kind of give this moment like a lot of credibility yeah it was, it was awesome. cool and you know what's funny is the building that was filmed in that was the american legion hall where 
the famous one where PWG ran for years. And, yeah. uh, and that building, I, I, I've, I've been wrestling in that building since the the nineties and, uh, that building also, uh, fun little bit of trivia in that very building CD and I also filmed a, uh, a bit for a show that was on comedy central, I think called the Kroll show starring Nick Kroll. Unfortunately, our stuff never aired, which really bummed me out because I thought it was super funny. And if there's, I, I hope to God they release it someday because it was really good. But uh, so I had a lot of history in that building and that building sadly is no longer there. So it was cool to film that show in that building. That was also pretty special to me. And you did the man show too, right? Uh, and you uh, taught those guys how to wrestle. Yeah. Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla. And, oh, and this yeah. was, uh, this was years ago. This is when I was still, I was, I was wrestling. I was maybe a year or two into the business and I was, I was continuing training at a place called the school of hard knocks at the time ran by Jesse Hernandez and Bill Anderson. And again, the benefit of being in Southern California and wrestling being white hot, uh, mainstream at the time, they were looking for schools and promotions in SoCal. So those guys came and same thing. Those guys came and they, you know, we set up bits, but we just kind of, everyone riffed and, uh, we just kind of followed those guys' leads. And uh, that was cool for me, especially at that time, being such a young guy in the business and meeting those guys who were who were blown up on the man show. It was really cool, fun, unique experience. Yeah, I got to do a lot of cool stuff like that. I was on uh, I was on Blind Date. Uh, Blind Date, one time they had a guy and a gal come in to learn how to wrestle. I was there. And I was also, funny story, I was offered a spot on Blind Date to be mm. one of the day T guys many yeah. years, many years ago, obviously this is through UPW, which was Rick Bassman's territory out here. And uh, they offered a, a, one of our girls and me a spot to be on blind date and to go out on a date. And uh, when I was a much younger single man, obviously. And mm. so I went and did the audition and, you know, talked about myself, you know, Oh, I'm, I'm Frankie. I, I'm a pro wrestler. I enjoy this and that. And, I did the interview and they finished it up and they're like, okay, that was great. Can you do another one? And I'm like, sure. And they're like, this time, take your hair out because I had long hair at the time. I was like, okay. And they're like, here, put this on. And they hand me this like super tight tank top. And I was like, uh, okay. So I put it on and my hair is down. They're like, all right, now do another one. But this time kind of like do it like a bad boy. And I'm thinking like, <laughs> I'm thinking like, but I'm not a, bad boy so yeah, i had to like do this real terrible yeah so i did this you know it was like yeah i enjoyed going to the bar with you know like trying to be a fake bad boy you know like yeah and anyways long story short they contacted me they're like all right we want to send you out on their on your date and I, and I and i just said you know i'm not really not comfortable with this i think you got the wrong guy and basically turned down the opportunity but yeah just wasn't and again i was so focused on pro wrestling i didn't want to do anything that would tarnish my 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 good guy wrestler reputation well, let's oh, hear it boy. for the realism of reality shows, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Exactly. They're gonna send. They're gonna send some poor girl out on a date with a, a fake bad guy. She would have had a terrible time. <laughs> right. I would. It would, it would have been off. It would have been off. <laughs> We're talking to Frank Gazarian, and we have uh, fan questions for you, Frankie. This is AEW Unrestricted. Tony and Aubrey here with Frankie Kazarian, the wonderful, amazing man and wrestler that he is. Lots of outside projects, lots of cool shit, lots of fan questions today. So awesome. uh, let's kick it right off. Uh, Jake Chavez on Twitter, how close were you to going to WWE before AEW? And how much did the Bucks and Christopher Daniels influence your decision? Well, as I said earlier, uh, you know, the minute the concept of AEW itself was pitched, I was on board. And, you know, we kind of had, a, we had a real tight, bond. we still do. We had a real tight bond, SCU and the Bucks. And also, you know, Cody and Paige. And we were all together all the time. So, uh, and we were all kind of in on the ground floor of this. And it, it, it was just one of those things that, that comes along and you can't turn down. Uh, at the time I was coming up at the end of my contract and, uh, you know, there, there was, there was some mild talks and uh, those came about because I have several friends up there. One of them reached out to me and said, Hey, somebody would like to give you a phone call. And I said, certainly I'll take a phone call and talked. And at the time I really couldn't say much because again, AEW wasn't a thing. 
Right. You know, so I really couldn't say much. I was just like, oh, you know, there's some other, you know, so there's some other things going on. And, you know, and, you know, they probably at the time thought I was going to stay with Ring of Honor or who knows what I was going to do. But I was just like, oh, there's some other things. So I kind of danced around it. And I didn't really I didn't really let the talks get serious because my mind was kind of made up. But uh, there were certainly talks, you know, I'm a businessman and I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've been around long enough to know that, you you know, you don't not take phone calls. So um there was mild talks and I, like I said, I have a lot of friends up there. Uh, it's, you know, I, I grew up watching WWE. So if it wasn't for WWE, I don't know if I would be the fan I am. So, uh, but AEW for me was just, I, I could not pass it up. I could not imagine my life now if this wasn't around, I don't know what I'd be doing. It'd be, it'd be weird. Yeah. It's changed the lives of many of us. I, I know it could speak for me and, and Aubrey on that. So. Yeah, it it's really, really it's it's you know I say this all the time and I say this to the younger guys and, and Tony you can attest to this that it's it's not like this in other wrestling companies you yeah. know the the, the camaraderie we have the closeness the the way we're taken care of Tony Khan treats us all so well we're mm-hmm. treated like athletes and we are we are we are fed and we are taken care of and are. Mm-hmm. It just I can't, I can't say enough good things. I've never felt more respected as a talent, right? Uh, in any other wrestling company, and that's no disrespect to the other company I've wrestled for, but sure. this is just on another level, right? I- I'm with you, man. I- I'm with you 100 percent on that. Let's go to El Mustachio Saved, who's on Twitter. Uh, just wanted to know how you came up with Do Ya. It always cracks me up. Okay, I will give you the. Uh, I-, I will. G- I will try to make this short as short as possible I've, I've told it before but i will okay please uh so the origin of Duya is i my first ever opportunity to wrestle a dark match for the uh then wwf i yeah probably because this was late 99 or early 2000 right. and uh the match was going to be a tag team match with me and another local guy and we were going to wrestle bob holly and crash holly at the time okay. and uh i'm super nervous i'm 20 years old, 21 years old, whatever it was. And uh, so, you know, we kind of talk about the match and there's this, this, this was different times. In, in fact, they were going to give us a promo for the dark match. We were going to go out there and challenge anybody to come out and the Hollies were going to come out. Just what you wouldn't see that now. Just give Wild. two local schmucks a promo. Like, yeah. So anyway, so we're putting the, we put the match together and, uh, you know, kind of standing there and gorilla waiting, waiting for it to start. And I'm nervous. And I got, I got this stuff called hot stuff sprayed all over me. And Bob yeah. Holly's just there and he's pumping up and Bob Holly's jacked to the gills. And, and he's looking around and he's like, who the hell's wearing hot stuff. And I'm just like slowly back away, basically sprint back to the locker room, kind of hose myself off, <laughs> come back, you know, sitting there waiting and just there's the four of us there and he's pumping up and he has his bands and he's just pumping up and I'm right there next to him. And, and it's just, there's this real awkward silence. So uh, uh, I'm thinking like, I should, I should really start a discourse and like, you know, cause you know, just so we can get on the same page. And at the time I liked Bob Holly's entrance music. I thought it was good. It's real heavy. I loved it. So I just, uh, Bob Holly's right there pumping up and I just look over and I, and I, in, in my head, this is what I sounded like a prepubescent teen. I just went, Hey, I really like your entrance music. <laughs> and Bob Holly just stops working out and looks at me and goes, do ya? <laughs> and then continues working out. And I just kind of like go, yeah, it's, it's real heavy. I like the riff. And my, my partner was he's looking at me like, and then, so we got a break from those guys. Like those guys went away to talk about something. He's like, you Mark, why'd you say that? I'm like, I don't know. I just thought of what so every time I tell that story, uh, uh, people, people laugh and funny. Oh. I'll give you guys this one. I told Bob Holly that's because Bob Holly and I became very friendly on a tour of the UK and, and, uh, and he remembers this, he remembers that, but he I tell him the story and he goes, you know why I said, do you? And I go, no, I thought you were just being like, like, do you, you Mark? And, uh, I go, no. And he goes, because I liked it too. Uh, but I, but I thought you were just screwing with me. And I go, <laughs> Bob, why would I, why would I be, you know what I want to do before I'm about to wrestle Bob Holly? I want to mess with him. Yeah, right. I want to fire him up. So we joke about that. But so that's where, so that's where do you came from. So 
it's just, it was such a, like, it's such a way to put someone in their place without swearing at them without, yeah. it's just, just do ya. And it's just, there's, there's no answer Yeah, wow. as I that, learned. That is a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous story. It really oh boy. is. It's lasted well, the test of time. It's fa- <laughs> in fact, it, that, that, that catchphrase, I, I think is going to be my damn. What damn is to Ron Simmons? Do you is going to be to me? And I'm perfectly fine with that. I like I the mean, fact. You already, you already got it on a t-shirt, so you're halfway there. Yeah. There you go. I like the fact you went back and hosed yourself off. Oh, yeah, <laughs> because, yeah. <laughs> because, of course, I'm doused in this stuff. And, you know, Bob Holly hates it. And, of course, I'm, I'm the poor sap that gets to wrestle him. So I'm like, well, maybe he will beat me less if I don't stink like, like, like menthol and whatever the hell else is in hot stuff. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. so I would like basically host myself. Cinnamon. Funny thing is that, that match that we were talking about actually ended up getting scrapped because of time, but I did mm. end up wrestling Bob a couple times, uh, months and years later, just out here in SoCal in dark matches and then proceeded to get a severe beating, but had fun matches. Cause he's, he's great. Yeah. And you didn't wear hot stuff at all when you wrestled him, right? Probably not. I try. I probably moved on to whatever I thought was the next like product that was going to make me look better than I should some form of oil or tanner. I've, I've tried everything. If they put nuclear waste in a, a spray bottle, I would probably spray it on myself, especially back then just to enhance my look. Enhance. Right. All right. The real wrestling show on Twitter asks being one of the most impressive high risk, high flying moves I've ever seen. Do you feel like using the flux capacitor now uh, and has it got harder to pull off as you've gotten older? So that move is kind of my break glass in case of emergency move. Uh, mm. You know, like I, that's something I did when I, when my style was much more high risk, which is odd because I was never really, really a high flyer, but I kind of got categorized as that when the X division started, you know, I always, I always liked to classify myself as like, as like a technician, like a, you know, a Bret Hart, a Tito Santana, a Kurt Henning, but I kind of got grouped into those guys. So I started doing a lot of that, that style and those kinds of things. Uh, and, and, uh, that move I did a, a lot more when I was a younger wrestler, uh, as my style has evolved, I've kind of, you know, put that on the back, ter- back burner because it's one of those moves that I really don't want to kind of prostitute out. I see a lot of really high impactful moves being done so often that they lose their importance. Right. You know, and so that move for me, when, when people see me hit that, it's like, wow, like I've, I think I've hit that move. I want to say three times in the last five years. Uh, and that might be being generous. So uh, the move is difficult to perform because it, it's, it's another grown human being I'm doing it with. And it's, it's, it takes its toll on the guy giving it too. But uh, I, I always have that in my back pocket. It's always a, a tool I have in the tool belt in case of emergency. Uh, going to music, Dylan Hager on Twitter wants to know, what are your top five metal songs? Wow, Dylan, put me on the spot. Top yeah, five metal all, songs. Okay, always this, put you on the this, spots. Oh, man, yeah, that's, you know, that's like asking what's my favorite breath of air. I don't know, the next one, this one, <laughs> that one, I don't know. Uh, let's see, um, w- without giving it a lot of thought, and this list will probably change, uh, top five, I will say Master of Puppets by Metallica. I will say Raining Blood by Slayer. I will say uh, I will say Iron Man by Black Sabbath because they're the inventors of heavy metal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say uh, The Trooper by Iron Maiden, and I will say, oh boy, uh, got to throw something in there by maybe Pantera, maybe Walk by Pantera, uh, just go. off the top of my head. But my God, that's a, that's a tough one. Oh boy, Joe Pro on Joe Pro Wrestling on Twitter asks, can you tell us any funny stories from PWG? Funny stories. Well, PWG kind of was one funny, one big funny story. Uh, really, a lot of silly that. stuff. But I will tell you one that involves uh, uh, my old friend Scorpio Sky. So Scorpio Sky and myself had a year long blood feud in PWG back in two thousand five, two thousand six ish, two thousand seven. Really, uh, I, I actually asked to work with him because at the time he was fairly new. And I said, this kid's good. I'd like to do something with him. So we put together this year long feud and uh, 
you know, there was a lot of rumors going around about my hair and like, people like, Oh, I can't believe he left WWE because he wouldn't cut his hair, which was BS. That wasn't why. So to kind of prove a point, I, I had an idea. I said, oh, Sky, I want you to cut my hair like as an angle. And he said, Oh, okay, that's great. And I said, I'll do a thing where you hit me with a, a chair and knock me out and cut my hair. And this is, this is, let me preface this by saying this was before we knew what we know today about head trauma and chair shots to the head. Mm. A much younger, much more ignorant Frankie Kazarian suggested this. Here we go. So I told Sky, I said, so we did a match. And afterwards, I had a, my idea was I wanted him to hit me in the head with a chair twice. And I was oh. telling him all day, I said, Sky, I want you to hit me in the head with this chair as if your life depends on it. I want oh, you to the absolutely swing for the fences. And I was going to have him hit me and I was going to get up and I was going to hit me again and knock me out because I wanted to be out cold because it's going to be real, damn it. You're not going to cut my hair unless I was unconscious. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm, so I'm badgering this guy all day. I'm like, make sure you bring that chair shot. Make sure you bring it. Make sure you bring it. <laughs> so we get ready to do the thing. This guy has the chair. I turn around. Now, when I say he hit me hard, I, I don't. All I remember is him swinging it, the sound. And then I remember just looking at him going too hard and crumbling. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so out of it. And this guy's in my face and he's like, like he's looks like he's jaw jacking me, but he's going like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Are you okay? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And I stagger up. Cause we were going to do two. The second one, no. was, the second one was, you know, dink, like dink. <laughs> so, anyways, he, yeah, so he cuts my hair and it was, I, I, I was, I was not so stupid concussed as we know today, you know, yeah. I know this sounds wildly irresponsible, but, Again, this was me much, much more ignorant. I remember being at a jack-in-the-box on the way home, and all I remember is sitting there and the lady going, sir, sir, and just, yes? So what would you like? And I'm like, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, I'm a jack-in-the-box. Wow. Um, and uh, so, yes, that's a funny story. And, yes, it's I know it's, it's um, very scary also. Uh, happy to say, in terms of, like, head trauma, that was kind of probably the last time I ever got my cage rattled like that. And uh, thankfully so, because we now know what we do and, you know, the, the, the training we've all had, it's, it's very important to take that type of stuff into consideration, but uh, I can talk about it now because it was funny. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm perfectly fine. And it involves Scorpio sky. And it was just, uh, he was scared. <laughs> to death. Yeah. And it was, it's, it was, it was ridiculous. The the funny part of that story is all day, lay it in, oh, lay yeah. it in. And as soon as oh, he laid in, you went too hard. Oh, because I'm badgering him because I'm just like, I want to make sure. I was like, this better not look fake. Dude, you better, you know what I'm saying? And just, that's all, that's all I could think to, you know, ting, too hard. That's yeah. all I could think to, poor <laughs> sky. Like, like imagine the emotions running like, through like, Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and he's, like I said, he's a young guy in the business and I was, you know, the respected veteran at the time and, uh, yeah. So now we, now we, uh, we laugh about it. Like anytime sky has a chair in his hand, I'll run in the other direction and he'll, it's just, it's, even if he's just unfolding it to sit down, I'll run in the other direction. It's great story, Frankie. All right, Frankie. Thanks a lot, man. It, it's always a joy talking to you. You're one of the pros, man. We love, we love your matches. I love calling them and, and I'm really excited. I, I finally got to work with you too. Likewise, Tony, like I said at the beginning, man, it's, you know, it's never lost on me that you get to, that I get to have you call my matches. It's really, really cool. Uh, and it's really cool to call you a friend and same with you, Aubrey. I'm so happy with your success. Uh, I remember first meeting you up there, uh, or was that in Canada, Vancouver somewhere? It was Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And, uh, you know, seeing your potential and seeing what you're doing now and how you're just killing it and how you've broke, broke those barriers for for females it's it's really cool to see man so i'm i'm happy to be on the show and happy to talk to you guys it's welcome full circle <laughs> all right yeah. uh, Fr uh, frankie you can follow him on twitter at frankie kazarian and on instagram at frankie underscore uh, frankie kazarian underscore official and don't forget to subscribe to our AEW podcast for free wherever you get your podcast don't forget about the AEW casino game right that's Aubrey? right it's available on the ios store google play store bunch of casino games all in a single app you can play with your friends you can play with me you can take all of my money because i'm not actually good at poker download it today support AEW games absolutely and don't forget you can check out the video of this podcast on youtube and as always there is dynamite each and every wednesday night on tnt eight o'clock seven central i'm aubrey edwards here with and Tony i'm Chilani. 
Yeah, I'm Tony Schiavone, and this has been Frank Kazarian, and this has been AEW Unrestricted. Hell yeah.